Cool, awesome. Welcome, everybody. We'll get started now, right on time. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about Radical, um, which is a project that I work for. And we're going to be talking about building decentralized code collaboration on Ethereum. So let's get started. My name is Abby. Um, I kind of lead all things community at the Radical Project. It is a Radical Project. It is a free and open source project, so we have a bunch of different contributing teams. I lead the community team, um, which touches uh, all parts of the stack, if you will. And I also uh, talk about Radical the most. Um, so today, we're going to be doing a brief overview of uh, like why Radical. Last year's talk at ECC was like really diving into like the problem that Radical is solving. So this will be like a really nice, natural continuation. Um, I should have given everybody homework before coming. So we'll talk about why Radical, then we'll talk about what is Radical, and then really the meat of what I'd like to chat about today is what um, Radical's doing on Ethereum um, with our newly launched Ethereum integration. Um, so that should be really fun. I'll talk, I think I have 40 minutes, which is a really long time, so I'll just talk for 40 minutes, and then uh, if we have extra time, I'll just demo some stuff and kind of show you guys some stuff live. Uh, so yeah. So um, to kind of frame the conversation to ECC and while we're here, um, so right now I'm in the Web3 track um, and I think all of us can kind of agree, I mean, I, I, Ethereum is a lot of things, but I think a lot of people who are in it for the tech like agree that Ethereum is the platform for the decentralized web, right? And it's a huge part of this thing, this ephemeral thing that we call Web3. I think you can call it like a religion. You can call it like a lifestyle. Um, but I think that Web3 really does represent this transition from an internet controlled by centralized platforms to an internet powered by decentralized protocols, right? So it's taking this like Web2 version where corporations and gatekeepers are in control of how, what you read and what you write. Um, and it's returning control back to the user and saying you can read and write to the web, um, but you can do that in a verifiable and secure way. And so that's kind of what I think um, you know the Web3 vision is and how Ethereum is taking part in that. So if we look at the state of Web3, um, there's been a ton of progress towards this vision. Of course, this vision like started before Ethereum as well. Like I think people have been kind of, this is more of a general trend that people have been moving towards in the internet. Um, but specifically in the crypto space, like we've been building so much in Web3. We have infrastructure, developer tooling, even financial primitives are like very strongly contributing, like DeFi and everything, contributing to the vision of Web3. Um, and all these user interfaces that are making it easier than ever, um, you know, to kind of build, uh, use, and experience the decentralized web. Um, the other thing that I think is really cool about the Web3 space is kind of its inherent qualities, right? Like the Web3 movement is one that is entirely online, right? Completely open source and values decentralization. And three, these, this is like the trifecta, right? And I think that this is a really cool part about this space um, is that not only are we building an online open source decentralized web, but we're doing it completely online. We're doing it in a decentralized way and we're doing it completely open source. So it's, an, it's a movement that embodies its values as well as kind of um, its values of what it wants to build. Um, you could call that principle development. Um, but us at Radical think that there's kind of this elephant in the room, right? Um, which is as we're building towards this decentralized web, um, our hosting, our code sharing, our hosting, our collaboration, and the distribution of the code that makes up Web3 is actually very centralized, inherently centralized. I think that this is really funny. Um, you have to sign in to GitHub, you know, to like access your Web3 code. And so this is, um, you know, I think a lot of people can ask, you know, maybe you're wondering, like, what is the problem with centralized code collaboration? We use GitHub every day. We use GitHub at Radical. GitHub is an example of uh, centralized forge. Um, and it works really well. And I think a lot of people, um, you know, as we try to define and, and talk about, like, why Radical, ask, okay, well, why, why not GitHub? Like, why fix something that isn't broken? And so to answer that question, I'd recommend to go watch my last ECT ECC talk from, I guess, last year, whatever, two years ago, time is not real anymore, um, where I literally spend 40 minutes kind of like talking through this. And I think that the problem is actually systemic and um, has so much more color and it's so much more of like an ideological argument. But I'll give the TLDR here. Um, so I think that the TLDR of like why centralized code collaboration is a problem is because at the end of the day, like GitHub is another walled garden, right? GitHub is a hosting service for, um, 
hosting Git repositories that's built on top of Git, right? So it actually uh, is a walled garden built on open soil. Git is it opens free and open source distributed version control system um, that was designed to be <laughs> completely decentralized, designed to be completely free and open source. And GitHub actually built a proprietary platform on top of that open protocol, similar to all the other walled gardens that we're trying to uh, break down um, and build alternative alternatives to in the Web3 ecosystem. So at the end of the day, GitHub is this, right? GitHub is a walled garden, and so it does experience the issues um, that come with being a centralized, censorable, um, and, and um, corporate-owned platform. Um, and so I think that all of us being in the Web3 space, we can kind of agree that ideologically that's something that we want to move away from, right? Like that's a future that we don't really want to be a part of, we don't want to support, we don't want to subscribe to, and we want to build alternatives too. So ideologically, it like makes sense that we start um, seeking towards and, and building towards decentralized alternatives to centralized collaboration. However, the argument is not only, only ideological. Right? Like there are very real problems with code collaboration that right now are kind of just like bubbling under the surface. But the more and more software like eats the world, the more and more we build technology that is um, challenging traditional institutions who might not be happy with what we're building, the more these problems will kind of come to the surface and become critical points of failure for not just you know, the software, but like the movement, the Web3 movement as a whole. So, these problems, um, I kind of like categorize them in three problems. Like the first is platform risk. So these corporate owned platforms are obviously very vulnerable to censorship, right? Um, and capitalist ends. Uh, so I think everybody is probably aware of like recent things that have happened over the last, I guess like a year almost, of GitHub censoring. Um, actually, I can, I have it in the next slide, so maybe I'll just reference them here. Microsoft disabling a free and open source repository for YouTube DL, which is like a very widely used free and open source tool, um, after being uh, legally asked to take it down um, by the RIAA, which is the Recording Industry Association of America. What do they have to say about code? Do you know what I mean? Um, and this was a very interesting um, uh, example of how a legal institution was able to attack source code um, and, and do that under the means of GitHub being a proprietary corporate platform that has um, uh, certain terms of services attached to it. Another one is GitHub obviously blocking developers in Iran, Syria, and Crimea. Same with GitLab actually due to US sanctions. Um, you know, these are US companies that are able to, like any other platform, uh, restrict who uses um, and who is able to access the data on their platforms. So that's the platform risk, right? Um, and the capitalist ends is obvious. I think that there's this really good um, piece from Chris Dixon um, at A16 about the argument for decentralization, which is that ultimately all um, centralized platforms will leave their users vulnerable to extraction just because of the way that they're like systemically designed. And so that's another really cool piece. Moving on though, there's also inherent security risk um, with hosting your code and not just your code but your collaboration on a central platform. These central platforms are single points of failure and provide many different attack vectors um, for malicious actors and I think that we've seen different security breaches, leaks um, and other people manipulating everything that is kind of like a web interface um, to insert malicious code into repositories. Obviously this is um, more important for people who are building like very security conscious software and who need to be thinking about this. But this is another point. And then vendor lock-in, which I think is the one that really convinced me, um, which is that like all non-Git artifacts, so Git is your source code, um, it's your commits, it's your version controlled history. All non-Git artifacts that we use to collaborate, so like the actual, everybody's like, okay, well Git is decentralized, so it's whatever. That means that you have the source code. I think all of us know, I'm sure I'm surrounded by a bunch of developers right now, that like collab code collaboration goes beyond the code, right? And it's actually more about the collaboration. It's about the issues, it's about the discussions, it's about, it's about the, the PRs, the reviews, um, even the identity, the GitHub profile, the contribution graph. Like there is so much more that goes into collaboration that is represented by social coding, right? And so it's really these artifacts and these workflows that are built around the repository that are sometimes arguably more important than the source code itself, right? And so all of these non-Git artifacts are entirely hosted by uh, place your centralized forage. I use GitHub too much in this presentation. Um, but so this social layer that's built on top of these repositories, which is taking code um, as, you know, kind of just source code and actually turning it into value, so the thing that's turning code from um, a liability into an asset is 
entirely locked into these platforms. Um, and so this is kind of an issue because if you wanted to move your collaboration somewhere else, you actually couldn't. It would be really hard. Um, and it's not within the platform's interest to allow you to do that. So that's kind of like the framing. If I haven't convinced you, like go watch my ECC talk. Like I have like a way better story around it. Um, but obviously this is super important. These three points are all things that us as people building towards this like web three vision, like we can't have this, you know what I mean? This is completely antithetical to the values that, of the future that we're um, building and presenting. So I think it's a pretty important problem statement. Um, so I think that this kind of really, really wraps up into the core belief of our team um, and kind of the belief that we're presenting, which is that our dependence, our dependence as people building towards Web3 in the Ethereum community, our dependence on centrally hosted platforms and corporations for the distribution of critical open source infrastructure is inherently unsustainable. And so not only does a Web3 um, movement need resilient infrastructure, but the free and open source moves, uh, movement needs you know, resilient infrastructure. We, there needs to be a shift towards um, creating more resilient, sovereign um, means of collaboration that aren't controlled by gatekeepers or um, third parties. And so that's where Radical comes in. Um, so Radical, uh, tis the root, it's kind of this like little slogan that we have. Um, so Radical is a peer-to-peer -peer network for co-collaboration. And so quickly before we get into what is Radical, Radical, R-A-D-I-C-L-E, is actually a botanical term. Um, it's actually the first sprout from a seed. So it's like the first part of the plant that like pops out of the seed. And I think that that's very fitting for what Radical represents, is that we want Radical to be the root of all collaboration. We want it to be uh, the first seed that springs um, from the seed that allows people to bloom and blossom. I think that that's just a cute little tidbit. Um, and so I think that this also plays into kind of what uh, Radical is all about, right? So we're all about no more walled gardens. Radical is built entirely on open protocols. So it starts with our peer-to-peer -peer network, which is powered by a, a gossip protocol called Radical Link. So Radical Link is actually built on top of Git. And it gives you a way to share um, and host uh, your repositories without relying on a third party. So what it does is it actually builds peer-to-peer -peer network, I mean peer-to-peer -peer discovery into on top of Git. Um, so again, you don't have to rely, you don't have to push to a centralized server that then shares your, um, you know, gives everybody an access point for your code. You can do that with each other. You can do that peer to peer. Um, and so I could uh, dive into Radical Link if we have more time as well. But so Radical Link um, at the baseline gives us this peer to peer network for us to share Git repositories with each other without relying on a server. So on top of this, um, we have our decentralized GitHub. So everybody's like, oh, what is Radical? I say the TLDR is it's decentralized GitHub. But at the end of the day, GitHub's just the interface, right? Like GitHub is just how you're building the collaboration experience around the repositories. And so when your repositories are hosted on an open source peer-to-peer -peer network, you can build whatever GitHub you want. You can build whatever interface, whatever client you want on top of that network um, to give people the ability to interact and, and, and publish data, um, read their data, and then collaborate on their data um, on that network. So we built Radical Upstream, which is um, a desktop client um, that allows you to create identities, push code, host code, collaborate on code. Um, entirely from your machine, which is really cool. And we actually just launched um, a web client. One of our contributors, Alexi, one of the founders of Radical, um, hacked on app.radical.network, which is the first um, web version of Radical. Both of these give you an entirely, you know, like give you your social collaboration experience. And we're building out kind of like all these different features on top of that. Um, but again, I'll say why this is so cool is that all of these clients are open source and forkable. You can build your own, you can use ours, you can contribute. And I think that that's also the power um, uh, with Radical is again, it's open protocols that's building these experiences, not one interface or one platform. So then on top of this, which is like really fun and obviously what we'll be talking about today is Ethereum. So we have an opt-in Ethereum integration, um, which is basically like a set of open source generalized smart contracts that we use to design different collaboration experiences on top of all of this awesome code collab. So I think it's important to note, and I, I realize that some people get confused by this, um, is that like we're not like logging code on chain. Like you're not like collaborating on chain, right? Like everything's happening on this peer-to-peer -peer network. And the power of Ethereum is that we're able to link um, our interactions on this peer-to-peer -peer network in different ways and anchor it on Ethereum um, to kind of create this global discoverability, this global layer on top of the peer-to-peer -peer network, which is what comes so easily to centralized platforms because they own all parts of the flow. So 
we'll get into that. But so our Ethereum integration is opt-in. You don't have to use Ethereum to collaborate on Radical, but it does offer some really awesome features um, that we'll get into next. So the value prop for Radical is basically like free your code. Radical allows you to collaborate entirely peer-to-peer. -peer. This means no more central servers, no hassle to set up like self-hosted Git instances, no censorship and no corporations. It's a completely free and open source network. It allows you to work securely offline. So as I was saying before, you had this lock-in where all of your non-Git artifacts are um, you know, locked into platforms completely owned by platforms. Radical is actually taking those social uh, coding features and bringing them back to you. So um, patches on Radical are Git tags, right? Um, issues will be local objects. And so this is also really freeing when you um, focus on you know, the concept of local first development. And it's like, what if I could take more of my data from the web and take it um, and br bring it back locally to me so I can control it um, and I can um, uh, interact with it offline and on my machine. So it's also built on Git, obviously, that's really cool. Um, and it's more secure, so everything's backed by public key crypto. So everything that I do on Radical is signed by my key pair. So there's also an added layer of security that comes into how I'm collaborating on these repositories um, that makes it you know, easier to trust people online. So that's also another good point. And then it allows you to own your own infrastructure. So like Radical is a free and open source project. It's free forever. It's available to everyone no matter where you are in the world. And it's completely open source. It's forkable, customizable. You can do whatever you want. Like Radical will be more than what we're building right now. And that's the point. Um, and I think that that's, uh, I think, also what code collaboration infrastructure should be. I think that was the original vision of Git. Um, and so we're trying to return to that ethos, right? Trying to return to that. Um, uh, those principles um, of owning your own infrastructure and um, building completely free forever. So, great. So, we launched Radical in beta this past December. Um, we launched the network and our um, desktop client. So, actually, you can use Radical today. You can um, push uh, code, you can publish code to the, uh, to the network and host it completely peer-to-peer, -peer, share, follow projects, and collaborate. Um, albeit in an old school way. So we launched this um, project and immediately saw thousands of projects on the network. Also some rat, uh, Web3 projects already experimenting, the graph hosting their protocol governance on it. Synthetix actually is uh, mirroring their repositories on Radical. Um, and so we've already started seeing the Web3 space start experimenting um, with what it means to have decentralized code collaboration built into their workflows. We also started um, building out the app. So um, recently we launched Patches, um, which are basically our version of PRs. They're like a super important <laughs> uh, means of collaboration before we were doing it very old school with mailing lists. Huge feature, and I think it represents kind of what's on the roadmap for our code collaboration side of things, right? Which is to continue building out the social coding experiences that make it easy to build software together. But doing that in our own way, um, and doing that through our clients and um, alongside of our users. So now, yeah, we're halfway through. We can talk about the really exciting stuff, which is what I think I've been excited about to talk about for some time, and kind of some of the newest stuff that's coming with Radical, which is Radical and Ethereum. So as I mentioned before, Radical has um, an opt-in Ethereum integration that kind of offers up the, the world of Ethereum to Radical users. Um, and so what the Ethereum integration does um, is enables three really awesome features that we think are going to really change the game for how people are building software together. So the first of those is Radical Orgs. So um, Radical Orgs are basically a decentralized code management tool for DAOs. Uh, DAOs I use generally, more decentralized online communities of people. You know what I mean? People coordinating on the internet. Um, and so orgs um, actually take this um, super user admin model that we have. Everybody knows GitHub orgs. That's like the way that you coordinate. That's the way that you represent and show yourself that you're on a team. And we say, okay, what if that's um, managed by smart contracts, right? So orgs allow you to manage right access to your code repositories with smart contracts. Orgs are, orgs are actually on-chain entities. Um, and these owners, these repos, sorry, these orgs um, can be uh, owned by Gnosis Safe, by multi-sigs. Uh, so they allow you to actually have a shared ownership of your code repositories um, and collectively manage the right access to those repositories. This is extremely powerful primitive, right? This is actually saying as a DAO that's, you know, building this software, that's governing this protocol, that's, you know, building this, this project together, we can collectively own, truly own, our code repositories and manage in a trustless manner how people interact with those repositories. We can also secure and anchor our project state, our canonical project state on chain in a way that's, again, trustless and verifiable 
auditable and um, secure. And so this is really powerful. So anchoring, which is one of the features associated with orgs, allows you to anchor um, your latest project state via commit hash, which is related to data that's on Radical, on chain. So people actually always know like what is the most up-to-date version of your code base. So this is great for like managing software releases, sharing code. You realize that when you introduce this kind of like more secure way of distributing software, that everything that we do now has all of these different attack vectors. And so this is a really powerful um, primitive for people who want to organize around radical repos. So orgs actually launched last week, and so we can even maybe go through a little demo if we have time. Um, but you basically can create orgs that are either owned by Ethereum addresses or by multi-sigs. Um, and so this is kind of what orgs look like in upstream. So again, orgs are on-chain entities. So like whatever client you build is able to kind of build their own experience or their own UI around how you visualize these orgs. Um, but you can have members, you can create different quorum thresholds for um, uh, anchoring projects. Um, our team, Radical Upstream, is, uh, has and maintains an org, and it's actually how we're going to be maintaining um, our core team development within the project. So this is like a great coordination mechanism for people who are trying to show how they're organizing around sets of repositories um, and doing it in a way that's like based on Ethereum identities, which is really powerful. Um, so Radical orgs becomes even cooler <laughs> with radical names. So radical names are basically like uncensorable developer identity. So when you create an org on radical, you can actually customize and configure an ENS domain using our radical registrar to that org. So you can say um, this org is owned by dxdao.radical.eth and you can configure an identity to this org, which is basically what you do when you create an org via your GitHub account. Um, and you can uh, use this to kind of you know, identify your team, your, your project um, on the internet. Um, in addition to this, teams will be able to specify where their code is actually hosted with org seed nodes. I didn't touch on this, but um, seed nodes are basically how you ensure data availability on the radical peer-to-peer -peer network. And so orgs can actually create their own seed nodes and they can say, this is where our code is always gonna be, guaranteeing you know, their, their, the availability of their code on the peer-to-peer -peer network and also, you know, giving them a way to kind of, uh, this is like what their hosting will be instead of relying on GitHub. These org identities are also integratable <laughs> with other identity frameworks like IDX, that's leaking some alpha. Um, so you can also use these as a primitive that's composable and, 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 and integratable with like different identity frameworks on the web, making them more enriched with more data or enriching other identity frameworks with radical data, right? And I think that the point of this is that this does become like the decentralized developer identity of Web3. You don't log in with GitHub anymore, right? Like you don't have to uh, you know, sign in off with GitHub. This can be the referenceable developer identity that we start building like Web3 off of. Um, and that's kind of how we see it. In the context of orgs, your org profile becomes your new GitHub org profile, right? Like this is like the decentralized GitHub org profile that you can now share with people to say who's part of the organization, who's building what, what is the latest state of the code, and knowing and trusting that this is one all completely uh, hosted on a peer-to-peer -peer network, it's based and anchored, secured on Ethereum, um, and it's based in all of these Ethereum uh, identities that are then linked to your radical identities. So it's a really powerful concept. So this is actually a screenshot from app.radical.network, our web client, and this is the upstream org, and so you can see all of this um, information related with this. If this is our radical upstream repo that then you could use and go find in the radical peer-to-peer -peer network. So building on top of this, this is also some alpha, is that where this goes is it starts turning into a full-blown web client. So um, once you have these org C nodes implemented, you'll be able to implement source code browsing in, sorry, source browsing in the web client, uh, which allows you to actually navigate through to actually view the repositories that are hosted on the peer-to-peer -peer network in the browser which is like replicating the GitHub experience. So this is really powerful and something that we're gonna be shipping soon um, and allows you to kind of truly start creating like this decentralized you know, profile that you can um, point people to, to say, okay, this is where we're collaborating, this is what we're collaborating on. Finally, the last piece that plays into this um, is radical funding. So radical funding are, is a vague term because there's a lot of things coming with this and we're uh, teasing people <laughs> about what it's gonna be and starting to 
getting to it, but basically radical funding is bringing DeFi to the developer experience. Um, radical funding is open source generalized smart contracts that empower developers to control the production and distribution of their work. Um, and this can mean many things, but this is basically bringing DeFi to devs and creating something that we call DevFi, which is developer finance, which is super corny. Um, but the, <laughs> the main idea is saying, okay, DeFi is used to play all of these financial games. What if we could harness that and give developers a way to you know, fund and sustain their open source work? So with radical funding, we're designing experiences into these clients or in their own clients that will give developers a way to actually control um, and monetize um, and, and create sustainable recurring forms of revenue around their interactions on Radical. So this could be um, creating and distributing monthly FOSS support funds for projects that are like crypto native. It could be streaming tokens to contributors, to people who are part of your orgs, right? Um, it could be using Radical orgs to um, run grants programs, um, creating community tokens to collectively govern projects using orgs. There are tons of things that we can build and our team is focused on delivering some core experiences, but more so delivering the primitives that will allow people to build their own experiences. And so this is kind of like the what's coming next with Radical and Ethereum. So now we can shift into kind of my last talk, which is last part of the talk, which is kind of just like contextualizing this and like why we as a team think that Radical um, on Ethereum is kind of the future of collaboration. Um, and I think that we believe that Radical is a very fundamental part of this emerging Web3 stack that I showed you guys earlier, the state of Web3. is like Radical is able to underpin all of this development because it enables protocols, applications, organizations, these groups of people, uh, uh, DGENs <laughs> in the Web3 world to build on truly decentralized infrastructure, which is a very important part of securing the resilience of the Web3 space. It is making the code that we're building and the software that we're building completely uncensorable. You can't take it down. It's accessible by anywhere, by anyone, anywhere in the world. Um, and it really uh, embodies the values of the Web3 space. And we also think that DAOs, or you know, decentralized organizations of people on the internet, are the future of open source development as a whole. I think that it's best kind of captured by this quote, um, which is from this really great essay about governance and open source software, um, is that open source development is best understood neither, uh, neither as a primarily technical development or social process. And it's actually more of an inherent network of interacting socio-technical processes that are intertwined, codependent, and co-evolving. And I think that this is kind of resembles what is brewing in the DAO space is that we realize that people can build software in better ways together and they can do that on the internet, they can do that completely anonymously. Um, and that is the future of open source software. And so if we need that, you know, open source de development is the OG version of common base peer production, right? Like DAOs are all about like building to the commons together, you know, like coordinating decentralized, like this all stemmed from like very early open source development, like commons based peer production was literally a term coined to describe the phenomenon of open source development. And right now we don't control the production uh, or distribution of our code. Like we don't control any part of this process. And so we need to be able to retain control of this, um, and we need secure and sovereign Web3 native collaboration to actually kind of steward this Web3 vision forward. And so we actually believe the future of open source software is self-sustaining, community-owned, and governed decentralized online organizations. And that's a bunch of words, but I do think that it's trying to contextualize what's happening now, where we have protocols that are being comp built completely online um, with each other, often anonymously, governing millions and millions of dollars and completely redefining a lot of things that we know about money, a lot of things that we know about um, the web and the internet. And so we think that the way that these um, projects and the software will be built is community owned, governed, focused on um, self-sustaining, built on crypto networks. Um, and if we want to be able to achieve that vision, like we need to decentralize our infrastructure. We need to decentralize the infrastructure that we're building the code on. Um, and we need to start experimenting with how we can power up these new ways of working, how we can make it easier for people to coordinate and operate, coordinate resources, develop software in a trustless and verifiable way online. And so this is why we are building Radical Orgs. Like Radical isn't about reaching feature parity with GitHub, right? Like it's not about becoming what GitHub is. It's about designing a new way of collaboration and building the infrastructure for that future instead of just replicating the future that we have now. And I think that that's a really important point when kind of understanding Radical. So 
we see all these DAOs. This is from, I think, um, a defiant post about, you know, like what is the landscape of DAOs. Look at all these people that are like considered DAOs. You know what I mean? Like DAOs used to be kind of this like weird, like, like esoteric framework for like how someone like coordinates and like literally DAOs are just like the way that we build software now in crypto. And I think that that's really important because now these DAOs, these protocol DAOs, these projects are coordinating resources, they're coordinating reputation, they're building social infrastructure that's not just, again, focus in the DAO space. It's more a, a greater part of this open source space. And we really believe that Radical can underpin every single one of these DAOs, that everybody can use Radical to empower themselves to continue building towards this decentralized Web3 vision. And so that's kind of like the greater picture of how we think Radical uh, fits into Web3 is that we want every DAO in the world on Radical. We want to give online open source communities the ability to truly own their code because we believe that this is the future of collaboration. It's not crypto specific anymore. Like this is the future of free and open source software um, and this is where we want Radical to fit into that future. So that's it. That's all I have. Um, you can <laughs> join our Discord, follow us on Twitter, go um, on our website um, and keep in touch. I think that I still have eight minutes left, so we could maybe do a Q&A, or I could um, show you guys orgs in practice. Maybe I'll do like, I don't know, what do you guys wanna do? Okay. Wait, 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 it won't be like a demo, you know what I mean? Like, I, it's gonna be like me just like messing around with everything, but yeah, we can do that. Um, but thanks for listening to the talk, <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs>I should still talk into the mic. Um, so this is actually Radical Upstream. So this is the desktop client um, that we launched with Radical. Again, it's a de facto way of interacting with the Radical network, but it's not the only way. So um, if you've seen Radical before, you'll see that this is new. So what we, the baseline of the Ethereum integration in Radical is it allows you to link an Ethereum identity and Ethereum address to your Radical identity via a protocol attestation. Um, I'm not gonna, I can, actually I could probably do this now. Um, so I actually, we have uh, integrated Radical Upstream with Wallet Connect, so I should be able to do everything from Rainbow. Um, but this allows me to say, okay, this is the um, Ethereum address that's explicitly associated with my Radical identity. And it's important that Radical identities um, are, um, uh, this is a device ID. So this is a, 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 an actual key pair that's related to my device, similar to like how GPG keys work and how you have to auth yourself to get into GitHub. It's kind of the same way. And so this is cool because you're able to say this developer on this device is related to this Ethereum address. Um, and anything that I'm doing um, when I'm pushing to this repository and collaborating on this repository is associated kind of with um, me. So that's why it's my developer identity. Um, so that's an error. So like I'm also in dev mode right now. So like we'll see how this goes. Um, but basically, um, what's also really cool about the orgs feature is that it's so natively integrated with Gnosis Safe that I actually, when I create a multi-signature org, I, um, I, so you can see it's actually working, which is great. Um, and I'm, I'm actually deploying a Gnosis Safe via the app. So what that transaction just did was deploy a Gnosis Safe. So now it's creating, um, and what that does is it allows me to now uh, have this uh, smart contract, which is the Radical Org, and then the Notes is Safe, which is the owner of that org, with me being the first member. Um, is this the org? Okay, so this is the new org that's just created. But see, it might not work because I'm in the wrong mode, which is really disappointing. I can't even, I can't even show you guys this. Whatever, but so this is on mainnet, and I think it's not working because I'm in dev mode right now. Um, but what you can see is all the orgs that have been created on the Radical network. So this is the desktop client where you can create orgs and again you can kind of be, you can do your Radical identity and everything. I can show you more after that. Um, but so the web client is the newest thing that launched with Radical orgs which is really cool because this gives you a way to kind of view your on-chain org and the data associated with it. Um, so for example this is an org that I created. Um, called Jello. Um, <laughs> as you can see, this is the safe that's associated with this org that owns this org. This is the address of the org contract. And then this is actually leads me directly to the Gnosis safe where I can uh, anchor projects um, on chain. Um, let me find one that actually has an anchor. 
So as I mentioned before, anchoring is kind of the, um, the main function uh, that you do with orgs. So I have to find an org that has an anchor to it. But when I anchor a project, I submit an on-chain message that uh, contains the latest commit hash of a branch of, of someone's remote um, that then I can actually view via this browser. Um, and as I said, you can uh, register ENS names, so um, you can do that via the web client as well. This kind of takes a little bit of time because it's just like ENS, you have to like commit it, so I'm not going to do this. Um, but you can register an ENS name on this website and then you can actually set it to, um, you can, look, I'll just show you. Yeah, do you like that? <laughs> I thought that that was actually really funny. I have it like linked in all of our documentation as well. Um, but so if we go to TunaSwap, you can actually edit the records that are associated with this ENS um, uh, name. So this is me being able to say, okay, this is the URL, this is the Twitter, these are the social handles. So you can configure this name and then actually set it to an org. So I can set it to an org and then that um, will be populated in this org profile. So this is kind of like the real org profile. If we switch to mainnet, I can show you um, some of the orgs that we have on mainnet right now. Um, so Radical Upstream is ours, as I said, so this is the anchor, so this is every time we do a release, we anchor our Radical Upstream repo um, on chain. And so it's like just a better way for people to be able to say, okay, this is the latest version of that software. Um, these are the members that are associated with it, the devs. These are going to be integrated with Ceramic Network, which will be really cool. So these will be able to actually be IDX profiles on the profile. That's super nice, right? That's some alpha. Um, that's coming soon. And then as I showed you in the presentation, you can actually click through here and be able to like view this code, right? And then potentially Git clone um, that repo in the future as well. So that's really powerful. Um, DXDAO is a project who actually created the one of the first mainnet orgs. Um, what's cool about DXDAO's implementation is that they're actually going to have their org owned by the DXDAO, which is a DAO stack DAO, which shows the composability of orgs. It doesn't have to be a Gnosis safe that owns it. It can be another DAO framework, um, and that's also really cool. So we're excited to see what they're building as well. Um, I think another cool thing of how we see orgs being used is for governance um, and for grants. Specifically for us, we're going to be organizing our core teams via radical orgs because we ultimately want all of our projects to be funded via the radical DAO. Orgs make it really easy for protocol treasuries for larger DAOs to modularize and understand like who's developing what within a protocol organization. And so this is like really cool when you're thinking of how can you fund project development via DAOs. You can have these development teams that maintain these organizations which have a relevance and maybe receive um, resources from like a larger DAO um, that allow you to kind of coordinate project development in a more modular and like focused way that's more focused on development. Interactions with these orgs um, uh, can be used as a basis for establishing reputation, as a way of understanding how to reward contributors. Um, everything now is, again, based with Ethereum identities. So you're able to kind of coordinate and program these different value flows around how people are interacting um, with an org organization. So that's also really powerful. Um, that's kind of it. I wish I could show you the upstream thing, but for some reason it's not working, and I, I, don't, I don't think, I mean, I could probably fix it right now, but maybe I won't. I think I might also. I think I might also be out of time, regardless. So, um, yeah. Thanks. I think we have time, so if you stick around. I can show you stuff.
And then this actually triggers an on-chain interaction that I confirm now, which submits this message on-chain. And so if I have more members in my multi-sig, um, that would then uh, go to them. They'd have to confirm it, and we'd have to achieve quorum before being able to kind of agree on that anchor. Um, and so I think that it's just me, so I think that I would just have to execute this transaction to get message sent. Oh my god, I hate when MetaMask does this in full screen. Um, no, right? <laughs> what? Thank <laughs> you.